There we go. There she is. Hi, Susan. We just called the meeting to order and then you appeared. So um, are there any adjustments or changes to the agenda? Now, I know that uh, we talked at the last meeting about wanting some clarification from Stephen on the role of the clerk. Would we like to add that in? Yeah? Yes, I would, yes, I would like to. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I don't have that document in front of me. Oh, all right. Um, Next time. Well, I could, I, I would be fine if we put it on there. I can, I can send it out to everyone. Okay, that'd be great. Um, okay. Um, and then anything else to add to the agenda or change? No. Nope. Um, approve the minutes. Thank you very much, Laura, for a job well done on the minutes. Um, anybody have any comments, changes or edits to the March 1st meeting, which really was not a meeting, but I think it's good to keep the record of it. No, no changes or comments? Not for me. Okay. Uh, anyone want to make a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, no. Okay. And then the March 9th meeting that was on a Thursday. I think we held it a week later. Um, those are very long and uh, detailed minutes. Thank you again. Um, anybody have comments or, or additions or edits? No? no. Anyone want to make a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. And second? second. I'll second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. All right. So I think the biggest uh, goal of our meeting is to um, look at the zoning changes and um, and Stephen's got answers and changes and our answers to our questions. Um, nominate nominate the administrative officer, which we'll do first on the agenda. Um, discuss the town plan, short-term rental, and discuss an annual meeting. Okay, so nominate the administrative officer who is sitting right across from me, and that is Stephen. Um, the Planning Commission nominates this position and the select board, joint select board and trustees, joint select board and trustees make an appointment based on our nomination. So um, is there a reason to discuss this or um, do we just sort of do it? Uh, it's open for a, for a motion. Okay. Uh, uh, put it, if someone moves it and they can put it on the table if there's any discussion. Okay. Um, this is something that it's a three-year position. Is that correct? Or yes. one year, three years. Three. Um, and there really hasn't been any documentation in the past of when it should happen. Um, and so you can tell me why we're doing it right now. Uh, we're doing it right now. So the last, the, the, so when I was appointed by, well, nominated previously by the planning commission when I served uh, yeah. interim and appointed by the trustees and the select board, that was the end of Neil's term, who was, who okay. was first appointed in 2020. So we're coming down to the end of that. Unfortunately, because we don't have a record of, we haven't drafted a procedure between the select board and trustees of when, like we don't we don't have a firm date. Right. Um, so I'm kind of going off of what some towns do where they start to say after the first, so after the election process and the first after town meeting is kind of when you go through that process. Oh, and so okay. this just happens to be the first planning commission meeting after that. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to establish some consistency yeah. um, for uh, across boards of how we do this. 
Um, and we just, we don't have a policy yet. Okay. So that's, and that's kind of why we're, we're going ahead and doing this now, because it's just the first time we've met since both town meeting and village meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember doing it for when Michael was the um, administrative officer. I don't remember nominating Neil, but of course we had an interim town manager and it was the height of COVID. So we'll start over here. So does anyone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to nominate Stephen as administrative officer. Okay, second. Frank? I'll second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Yeah. Anyone? Yes. Um, uh, I'm going to be voting no, um, which I hate. Um, and um, I want to share why. Um, and these are all issues that are public, either that have been raised during a planning commission meeting or in the newspaper. So three reasons, here's why. Um, so first, this is the first meeting I can remember that Stephen has sent out and posted the agenda as required by the open meeting law. The second, is that I don't think he's ever posted the minutes as required by law. And the only reason that they're happening now is because Laura's doing them. Um, those are both issues that have been raised several times during multiple planning commission meetings. Um, and then the third one is something that's been in the paper. It's a little bit more personal to me, but I'm raising it because it's has been in Vermont Digger and the Standard and the Valley News and Daybreak. Um, so in, in my experience, um, he's not following what's laid out in section 4448, specifically the part that reads, the administrative officer shall administer the bylaws literally and shall not have the power to, mit, to permit any land development that is not in conformance with these bylaws. Um, the issues that have come, I'm not gonna go into detail, it's not a details of this, it's not appropriate for this setting, but it, this has come up around an issue that my husband and I are having with clear cutting on a steep slope across the road from us. Um, I'm happy to circulate the Vermont Digger articles um, if anyone's interested, but um, I, I mean, I really hate, doing this, but I can't in good conscience vote oh, yes. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any comments? I, I, I would like to just ask a clarification. What, what happens if we didn't support this? <laughs> I don't know. You know? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think that would be a perfect question for VLCT. Um, well, hasn't the select board already appointed Stephen for three years? No. Uh, oh. So technically they have. Oh. I was the one that, that let them know that, uh, hey, I appreciate the appointment, but we really need to do these things um, as, as per statute. Um, so as so. he was saying, his, this past year is really the third year of Neil's three-year appointment. And to keep on track every three years, he brought this up to start a new three-year period. So I'm I'm attempting for the first time since I I, I don't know I, I assume that Michael's reappointments were always perfect and by the book, um, but I'm, I'm trying to reestablish some consistency hmm. across across everything after COVID and and now under new administration. So I just want to make sure that we're that we're doing this correctly. Anyone else have a comment or question? Um, I guess I have a clarification, which is just that um, since I've joined, which was last July, um, I actually think 
and and I don't know how we would check this, but I actually think all the agendas have been posted. They just haven't been sent to the commission, but they've all been posted to the website in time. And I only know this because Frank and I have been working on the website since last summer. And so I'm on the website quite frequently. And I, I recall a few occasions where I've actually sent it to the commission um, when, when other people have asked. So I feel like the only one I can recall that wasn't posted on time was the one for the March meeting where Stephen was on paternity leave, but I, I'm again willing to figure out and check the record with Nikki who maintains the website, but um, that's my recollection. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, okay, well, well I guess. I mean, oh, I, go ahead. I, mean I, I don't know a lot about some of the things that Mary Margaret just raised, but I, I just, you know, had some ruminations on um you know i mean obviously all of us start in a line of work somewhere at some point and even when we are very good at what we do we still um have oversights and we still have learning opportunities and i guess my question is when uh you know one of the things that i'm looking at whether it's an employee or any elected official is well when there's a mistake made is is there a learning lesson taken away from it and does the mistake continue to be made so um i don't know those, those that's just my ruminations on it but I, I don't know i don't know many of the other issues that mary margaret had pointed out um i mean from my my perspective um it does appear as though everything is now running smoothly whether that's laura stephen frank or any combination of people um I am glad that everything is moving smoothly right now. Thanks. Anybody else? Um, uh, okay, I think we should put this to a vote. Would someone like to make a motion? Well, Laura's already moved in front. Oh, we did that already. We did. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, all those in favor of nominating as the administrative officer for the next three years, beginning the first meeting after town meeting. Say aye, please. Raise your hand. Aye. Okay. Um, I can't see Frank here, so you up? Yep, okay. So it's uh, five to one. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we'll next move on to our zoning changes. Um, several of us made comments or had asked questions, and um, Stephen has addressed that. Now, I can't see them when we have. Um, here, I can stop share and then bring up. I guess I can just. Find where. Hang tight. That's what I want. There we go. Okay. Everyone see. All right, so I wanted to have time to put these together in any certain particular way so that they all work together, but we'll kind of just take them as they are in order. Um, okay, and stop, make comments, whatever, anywhere. I, I, this isn't necessarily like a presentation from me and a lot of it will require some discussion mm -hmm. because some of the questions are just it, it, it's a policy decision so i i have some input but not necessarily the answer uh, so the first one uh have the woodstock economic development commission edc housing group 
Woodstock Community Trust, Thompson Center, all of those two rivers been invited to comment on the proposed amendments. Uh, the answer for that one is, so the EDC housing group, Jill and Trina in two rivers, they, they both provided testimony to this commission. Um, also, I kind of, I kind of put them as the, the catalyst behind getting this started. Um, but also, so the community, the Woodstock Community Trust through Jill Davies um, and the Twin Pines Housing Trust um, through other various projects and, and continued policy talks, just one-on-one -on -one individually with our office, uh, we consulted them. Um, they didn't come before the commission, but because they're probably just really busy. Um, the only one is the Thompson, the Thompson Center. We, I, I did not have direct contact with them. Um, so that should, that should be someone that we reach out to as well. Um, okay, and then for, for Mary Margaret, your question on about the suggesting for the village uh, design review board and the town review board. So I, I looked it up just to clarify. So, so the design review board is responsible for assisting the, the village development review board in administering, administering the provisions um, in section 405. Um, so the design review board is specifically an advisory committee to the quasi-judicial board. Um, so the regulations really don't provide um, that the design review board take a role in, the, in this legislative uh, advisory process. Um, and then the, the South Woodstock Design Review Board, which is known as the Town Design Review Board. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not suggesting any changes to the South Woodstock Design Review Board. So that's why I didn't reach out to them. Does that help? I was just, since there were so many, I understand that legally, you know, it might not be required, but as a courtesy, since there's so many things that affect what would come below, before at least the Village Design Review Board, um, it seems like that would be a, uh, a, a good courtesy to um, invite them to engage in this. Yeah. Well, and I can I can reach out to them. We meet every every couple of weeks, so I can I can reach out to them as well. So that's why I'll, I was just answering that. That's the reason why we we hadn't to this point. But I I understand where you're coming from. Um, just missing. Those are just little changes that I will that I will update. Okay. So this is kind of the first point of, of I think what where we're probably going to spend a lot of time of discussion, um, which is really the, the statement slash question slash policy open discussion is what does the commission want to suggest? Uh, do we want to recommend that administrative permit be required for an ADU? Do we want to change certain things about? You know, I, I think that's that's kind of open. I, I, Feel like we kind of feel split about it and we keep coming back to it mm. um so the the comment that i made for 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 specifically to susan and mary margaret is just um one of the things that that we hadn't talked about is if the commission decides to to stick with the it does not require a permit um but would like to retain the notice to neighbors because it seems like that's what we're kind of getting hung up on is um the how, how do we how do we notify neighbors of something going on? Um, there is also there there is also something where I I would suggest that the commission consider that even if it doesn't require a permit, that before someone can live in it, a certificate of occupancy is required. We did not expressly put that in in the last uh, version, but that's something that I that I thought about that I would also suggest. Um, that said, I think that's just, now I think it's just open for whoever wants to. Yeah, does anyone want to address the permit issue with ADU? Um, I would want to ask um, Stephen how the idea was to streamline the process so that someone could build it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Realistically, how long would it delay it to require Simple. Yep, and I'm glad you got that because you asked that a little bit later. Okay. Um, so I looked this up. I mean, it, it can vary, but 
the average the average estimate for for something around an ADU is an estimated four to six weeks for an administrative term. Um, again, it, that depends on you know whether we're working with a contractor, or an architect, or someone's building this themselves, and we have to go back and forth. But I would say that that's kind of the average turnaround time. So so typically it takes us about ten to fourteen business days to get to review, receive additional materials and approve um, for an administrative process. And then each administrative permit has a 15 day appeal period before it takes effect. So the appeal is uh, the neighbors are noticed and they can appeal it or? So, so the 15 day appeal is when you, it, it's publicly posted yep. and it goes into the newspaper. Okay. So you have a 15 day appeal period after, after the issuance. Okay. So, sure. but unlike unlike a unlike a conditional use approval, which the detached department is what we have now, a conditional use approval is where you get the hearing notice before. But this wouldn't require a condition. No. No. So this would be very similar to the same permit I got when I built the garden. Correct. But I feel that there's more at stake here than a garden or a garage. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's why we keep coming back. To yeah, it. yeah. So uh, I just I feel more comfortable requiring a permit. Um, you know, I don't. If someone really wants to do this, I don't think four weeks, if it's on a good, you know, it's a short end, is going to really make a person not build it. I think. Well, my feeling would be that I'd expect to have to get a permit. So my first inclination would be go to the, the planning office and see how to deal with that. Anyone else have comments about this? Hey, I, I guess, agree with you. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary Margaret. Okay. I would say I, I agree with you, Susan. That was kind of the point of my next comment, which is that we're exempting ADUs, but we're requiring two households and accessory buildings to get a permit. It's like it, it the, the two just don't. It, it doesn't make sense to exempt one and not the other. Um, so I agree with Susan, I think sh should require an administrative permit and four weeks is not that long, four to six even. Laura? I guess I have a question just in terms of like scale, which I, I, I think I probably asked either separately in an email or somewhere in this document, which is just that like, I, I it ties into Susan S's comment actually about like how, I would love to know firstly, just like how many permits have been issued for ADUs like in the past year to give me a sense and like anchor in what kind of numbers we're talking about. Um, that that would be helpful um, to me. I don't know if we have that data tonight, Stephen, but that would be helpful, um, especially comparative to the other things that we're talking about that do require permits. Yeah, you had asked me that question. I forwarded it to, um... Stephen, you had asked how many ADUs have been built or how many permits have been issued and which zoning areas are they located, which I think is important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I'd, just, I'd be happy if we had the number for like the village since that's what we're talking about because I'd just be curious to know, like if we're talking about three permits were issued in the past year, you know, I feel like that's a... a, a I feel like that changes a little bit the nuance of the conversation, maybe at least in my mind, um, versus yeah. some of the other things that we issue permits for. But maybe you can speak to that, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so I I did not pull that that data, and part of the reason is because when I start looking at the data, we we don't have it defined as an ADU. Um, so it depends on what Michael or Neil or I have been talking. So since I've gotten here, I call them ADUs, and I think I've, you know, I have I have permitted far more six thousand plus square foot houses than than uh, ADUs. So wait, so I I would estimate that I've probably done a total of, of five, and two of those were after the fact permits from you know eight years ago. Oh. 
So maybe three in the past year, not even. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I might as well not speculate. I can okay. I can do my best to at least find our records are not perfect, but I can I can get closer than than that, just throwing out that number. So I'll get that for you. Um, Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna point out to I think Susan Silverberg made a really good point of of just the like with the even if we said there there's no permit allowed, I would still like I would see this as a success story of changing zoning regulations if we saw. 10 new ADUs in the village in the next three years. Um, I would, you know, that would probably be something newsworthy. Um, and and I, I keep reiterating the fact that, you know, ADUs are, are not solving the housing crisis. Um, it just, my point is, is a lot of these changes, and, and I'll reiterate this again when answering other questions, is, is we're just trying to eliminate as, as many potential barriers as we can. Um, but we've also heard from, from three people so far that said you know, four to six weeks doesn't seem like that large of a barrier. Um, so I'm also fine if, if we want to discuss and move forward with an administrative review permit. Can you tell us exactly what the difference is? Or is that what it's called? Administrative? Yeah, it, it's so, so it's just administrative okay. approval. So, okay. so it just comes through um, the administrative officer Got it. can choose that rather than it going in front of the board. Susan? I just, I just want to build on something uh, Stephen said. ADUs aren't going to solve the housing crisis, but they nothing is going to solve the housing crisis single-handedly, right? This is a very incremental approach. I think that why they're critically important is that particularly for older people. And we do have anecdotal evidence, and certainly there's anecdotal evidence everywhere where I do planning, is that you know they are overhoused, but there are no options uh, for them to downsize within a community and to age within the community. And many of them don't wanna really leave their homes. And so we have a great mismatch. And so those ADUs often provide a wonderful opportunity for them to move to smaller quarters and a neighborhood and a place and to hold on to their asset and either rent out the main house or have you know family come. And you know, all of that contributes to really trying to serve our current population as well as, you know, however else those ADUs can help. So it is incremental. There's nothing that's going to produce 500 units of housing, but I think that every little piece of increment helps. Thank you. My, my soapbox, sorry. <laughs> Did you have your hand up, Frank? It could. I... No, I, I just want to okay. second with uh, what Susan just said. I, I agree, one hundred percent. Thanks, um, Nico. I know you had some concerns yeah, about ADUs. I, I am so vehemently opposed to ADUs in general, and I've I've just seen them. I've seen them, you know, do the exact opposite of what everyone is talking about here as being, you know, this uh, part of a solution. I, I don't think they're part of a solution. I think they're part of a problem. Uh, part of the problem is that they actually do the exact opposite of what people are talking about, and that is that they increase the value of property. They create barriers to buying property because now the land is worth more because you can build an ADU and rent it out, and now a house that maybe you could have bought for five or six hundred thousand dollars is worth eight fifty or nine fifty, um, and that's what I've seen. I mean, that, that's it's it's not you know a theory, it's not a fear, it's it's, it's reality. Um, and, you know, maybe there's only three this year and five next year, but it's a snowball effect. And when neighbors or other people see other people doing it, that's what creates the snowball effect. So it, it does, it, it can, in fact, uh, get out of hand and, and it can, in fact, have real significant changes in terms of price of property in the village. Um, and, and my big concern is, is changing the character of the village. I mean, you're, in theory, talking about doubling the population or, or you know, adding 30% to it or 40% to it. Um, and I just, I, I just have a philosophical issue doing that. I, I think that if we're looking at solutions for housing, uh, we should not be making ADUs a right. 
We should not be eliminating barriers to them. We should be uh, doing everything we can as a community to incentivize through money, through either, whether it's taxes or through some other form as a government entity, we have the, the ability to um, you know, do that. We should be incentivizing you know, developments of, of dense housing, 40 units. You know, we can cut, we can put up uh, buildings in various places that have large number of units. I mean, obviously what happened at um, was it Stafford Commons, huge failure, um, but you know, that's a different issue. That's a totally different issue. Um, but that, you know, that's just, that's just how I see it. I, I see ADUs as, as, as creating lots of issues for people like myself who want to buy a place and uh, want to live in a village setting. Um, and want to have a certain character in that area. And now there's, a, there's an economic barrier because the, the cost of the property has gone up 40, 30, you know, 30 40, 50%. So- but Presumably uh, that could cover your extra uh, carrying costs because you could be renting it out. Well, <laughs> that, that's assuming that I have a rental unit. But again, the whole point is I want, I want a backyard you know, in a little village setting. I want a backyard. I want to be able to go out my backyard and not have the neighbors who has an ADU in their backyard overlooking my backyard and, you know, being able, I mean, it's just, it's a privacy thing too. And I think the village, especially, you know, that's my biggest concern. Um, you know, th this really should be, I think it should be a vote. I think this is something that should be decided by people that live in the area and have to live with the consequences. I don't think it should be decided by us um, on, you know, what what they're going to be stuck with. But that's... Well, I think the state has already made this decision for us. I mean, ADUs are allowed. They're allowed, right? But I mean, it, what we're talking about here of, of eliminating uh, of eliminating zoning um, and yeah, disregarding know. parking. Disregarding parking. That's a, to that's a different... That's a different issue. We can discuss parking also. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, you're questioning the whole premise of the Planning Commission. What you're saying is you, that basically the town structure in terms of decisions are going to be made by the entire population kind of coming together, um, which kind of negates what a traditional Planning Commission does. I mean, how do you propose I guess I have a number of questions. The first is, I mean, if you look at the built, the, the village used to be denser than it is now. Um, and traditional village patterns throughout New England were traditionally very dense with no, Woodstock didn't have zoning that separated uses until very recently. So it's always for me, what character are you trying to preserve? Like are you trying to preserve what was here, what it might become, like where do you stop the snapshot but you know, the village right now, if you walk through many of these streets, you have windows looking into windows of neighboring properties. Um, and certainly, you know, you couldn't build an ADU everywhere. So this is this is, you know, if you look at Stephen, do you have any assessment? I've done a kind of quick look through the maps of where ADUs could be built. I just want to be careful not to kind of make a generalization about, you know, could we double the village? Because we clearly can't. We can't because there is not enough available land. I also think that there are many people who do in fact buy houses that are you know, very close within 20 feet of their neighbors and looking from bedroom to dining room or dining room to living room. So um, we already have an existing character that actually is that. There's, well, there isn't different. a sense. Well, I think that's different if you're looking from bedroom to dining room, that's different. The two houses are built where the two houses are built. You don't have one house back to back and the other one overlooking on someone's yard. So again, I, I just, I see it as a, when I go through the village, these houses are not built in the last five years for the most part. There's no, this, these are old houses that have been here for a long period of time. They have a character and the village has a character. And I think preserving that character is important. And I think, um, you know, what we've seen in, in recent elections is, is the voters coming out and saying, yeah, we want to preserve that character. We don't want to turn Woodstock into the place that all these people that are moving up here, you know, away from, uh, you know, we don't want to turn it into where they just escaped from. And I think putting ADUs in, changing the character, doing those kinds of things, exactly what the residents here do not want to see. That's, you know, that's where I'm coming from.
Any any village residents have anything to say about that? I see Laura smiling. Um, I mean, I Nico knows how I feel about this, so I don't know. I don't. I don't want to be repetitive. I I measured actually the other day, um, and my house is eleven feet from my neighbor's house, um, and <laughs> like I you know, but like again, I I expect that density. I live in the village. I also think, um, I I I hear the concerns about property values. I I think that's a legitimate concern. I personally feel like it's outweighed by the demand for housing. And I, and I do think that the, <laughs> the ADUs that I'm thinking of, like there's a property, for example, um, there's a property on River Street that's owned by Jed and Julie Dickinson, D Dickerson, Dickinson, Stephen, maybe you know their last name. Um, anyway. They have a beautiful home on River Street. You would never know it's not a single family home. Um, they have an ADU in the back. Um, and they have four um, separate units within that single family home. And you, like walking by on the sidewalk, you would think it's a single family home. It's been maintained beautifully. Um, and they have provided housing. I mean, like there's nobody, I've yet to meet somebody who like hasn't rented one of their apartments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or know somebody who's rented their apartments. Um, we've had close friends that did it. Uh, we looked at it when we were moving here. Um, and so I think that, I think there's like a very specific narrative, which, which I understand. And I understand the concern in terms of like changing the character. I personally don't see it happening as somebody who lives in the village. Um, you know, I see a lot of things happening that I think are like more harmful. But, but I don't see this as being, um, especially to Susan's point about um, people who are aging here, which we know Vermont has a huge aging population um, and they're overhoused and they live in these ginormous houses without support. And, I, and I'm someone and my family is a family that is, has, we looked at several properties where that might have been a possibility so that my parents or my husband's parents could live with us and have multi-generational living on the same property. And a lot of our peers are in the same place um, in terms of wanting to facilitate that. So again, you know, like this is anecdotal, but I think that we should, I, <laughs> I say that knowing we should be making data informed choices. So while I hear, you know, like, I think development is, um, or, or, or development and mass is a solution. I think it's one solution. Like Susan S has said, you know, like nothing here is going, there's not one thing that's going to solve the housing crisis. I think we're making very small incremental changes to establish more housing over many, many years. We are decades behind in terms of the housing we need to create in this country. Um, and and yeah, okay, so that, that's my spiel. Nico knows it, we've been over this. This is not anything new, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'll say about living in the village. Um, Nico, ADUs, are here to stay we can't get rid of them but are how do you feel about permitting how do i feel about what permitting of them well i just don't feel that there's any basis to ease or eliminate any restrictions and and I, i'm going to die on that hill whether i'm right or wrong and outvoted or not outvoted i i will not waver on that <laughs> okay all right um any other discussion on this so we're sort of focusing on the permitting of ADU. Um, if I can put a follow-up question out to everyone, is there, when, when looking at the, the village map, does anyone, does any area or any district specifically pop out as, well, this is the area that I'm specifically talking about when I think ADUs should thoroughly be allowed with as just as dense as possible or are to the other hand are there specific areas where you say uh, this is where I think they you know we may not prohibit them but that's where uh, we should have a higher burden 
I, I, I don't know if anyone has any specific comments to that. So I know I'm beating a dead horse here because we, we talked about this. It would be very helpful, Stephen, to run through the options that are on the table for us to consider. And not only like, is it an administrative permit? Is it a permit? Is it no permit? But if you can just briefly talk through each of those, like what it is or what it isn't, we're not requiring anything, what, what notifications might come to neighbors? What are the requirements for someone filing the permit, the time frame, and then what are the opportunities to slow that down in terms of appeals, all of the other things? I think it would be useful to just hear it through comparing all of them because I'm still, I need to be able to compare apples to apples across all of these and I'm not 100% I'm not clear. So if you maybe could start with like where we are now. Um, and That's then great. go kind of get less and less restrictive so we know what options we're, we have. Great, um, so, so I can do that. Um, okay. So hopefully pretty quick, stop me if you have questions. Right now we have throughout the village in order to have a detached apartment, so kind of your tr traditional not attached ADU um, requires additional use approval. I believe in every district in the village. Um, so. That requires a 15 day before the village development review board has a hearing. Uh, you notice all of butters. Um, and then you have a village development review board hearing. If it's in the design review as well, you also have a design review board hearing. So about, I would say probably half of the parcels that are in the village that we're talking about is in design review. And we haven't taken that away. Um, so that's where we're at as of as of today. So the average time to build an ADU is about two to three months to to from, to get your permit. Stephen, um, can I ask how the abutters yeah. are noticed? Yep. Yeah. So we have to post the the public hearing uh, in in three places throughout the town, uh, and then they are notified by mail. Okay. Yeah. Physical mail. Physical mail. That's for a detached apartment. What about a garage? And you're finishing above a garage to be a, an ADU. Um, so that would count as a detached apartment. Oh, it would? Yeah. Okay. So the garage would require administrative permit, but the detached apartment above would require the conditions. Okay. Conditional use approval. Um, so essentially that's where we're at now. Um, the next level down, and, and this is over general, this is just, we're talking across the building. The next thing is if we just say in every zoning district, we get rid of the conditional use of uh, approval process and say, if you wanna build an ADU, we say, these are the criteria for building an ADU. All you have to do is meet these criteria and apply for an administrative permit. Uh, the administrative officer will then review that to see if you meet the criteria and then approve an administrative permit. So I mean, like we discussed earlier, that cuts it from you know two to three months to you know roughly between three to six weeks on average. I'll say four to six weeks just to be kind of conservative there. Um, okay, so the third the third well, option and, but Stephen and with that one notice goes out by being posted in the paper. Yes, thank you. Uh, so there is no, there's no public hearing process. You don't, the abutters don't get noticed beforehand. Uh, the abutters don't get anything in the mail. Um, so at the time that the permit is issued, it goes to the paper um, and within the 14 days and it's um, posted publicly. So we post those at, at town hall. Uh, and then uh, in terms of village uh, design review, uh, all of that would still apply if it, if it does apply. Yep, so if it's, if it's in the design review district, then it still goes through the design review. And design review is a little bit different in the hearing process and conditional use approval. 
So uh, design review, we we still we still post it. Uh, we just don't we don't have to post it in three places. We still try and do that anyways. Um, mm -hmm. But everybody gets sent three days in advance of the village development review board here. So it's it's not quite as burdensome um, of the of the hearing process and notice as conditional use approval, but it still has that if you're in design review district. So even if it's even if we do administrative um, administrative approval, if you're in design review district, it would still have that. Um, okay. And then what we have proposed on the table so far um, is that. We have this list of criteria, and we just say if you if you meet this list of criteria, then you by right are able to build an ADU. Once you are done building the ADU, and you still have access to to the council of, of our office, if you want to come in and say, "Hey, I want to build this ADU. When could I set up an appointment or a site visit? Um, I want to make sure that I'm doing it right." because we could we would set up that you still have to have a certificate of occupancy issued by our office, which means we just have to do an inspection to see that you conform with everything in that in the in the criteria. Uh, we just do that essentially after it's built. Um, and if we are driving by or I'm inspecting somewhere else and I see from the from the road that, Hey, it looks like there's an ADU being built, and it doesn't look like they're conforming with something. I can still issue a, a violation um, until they're until they're compliant. Um, I'm sorry, the administrative officer could could issue a violation. Uh, the thing that is different about that is that there is no, uh, there would be no posting in the in in a public place. There would be no uh, posting in the newspaper. So that's kind of the three different tiers. And then we go to kind of other options, Susan, which would be district by district. Do we say residential low, residential medium, and residential high? If you want to build an ADU there, it requires an administrative use, uh, an administrative permit. Um, but in light commercial, commercial light industrial. Um, some some more of the kind of mixed use traditional parts of the village. We say, okay, there you don't need a permit. Can you tell us which um, this kind of this lowest level of no permit is there any other construction allowed right now in the village that does not require a permit? Hmm. Um. I mean, the, the thing that first came to mind was like a fence outside of a design review. As long as you're under six feet, uh, at, at least in the side, four feet in front, six feet on the side and rear, um, you do not need a permit to build that fence. If you're in design review, you have to have a permit to build that fence. So I, I'm going to uh, just try to push this along. <laughs> I yeah. think that a fence is very different than a dwelling unit. <laughs> and um, having discussed these three options, I am in, I, I'm in favor of moving this to an administrative permit required, but not in favor of removing the permit requirement. Um, nothing else has removed, you know, other than a fence, everything else requires something. This is, this is someplace someone's going to live. Um, at the very least, it, it requires an administrative permit, which will allow noticing, obviously, all of the design review board, which is about half, half of this area. It'll still go through all of those reviews. Um, I don't know how other people feel, if we can kind of try to filter it down before we try to get more complicated about where or any of that. Yeah. And and just to just to clarify one thing, so so even if we don't have a, a permit review process for the ADU specifically, those those ones that are in design review district, even if we don't have an ADU permit, because it's in design review district, you would still have your ADU would still have to go through design review. Um, and all of this requires a building permit from the state, so you still have to. You can't just go up there and start just nailing random things and say like, yeah, it's safe enough. Um, you still have to follow the the, the IBC building code. So. Well, I, I would agree. I would agree with Susan. I think um, 
requiring an administrative permit makes sense. Absolutely. I agree too. All right. So are we good, Frank? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't realize I was mute. Um, just listening to what Susan just said, I, I think that we probably should have a, an administrative permit. Um, however, I do have a question though, Stephen. Um, do we have any idea of how many actual pieces of property are eligible for an ADU? Because it's not many. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I, I had the staff or time to to figure that out. Um, and by all means, if I, I would, I, I wish that we could send out a letter to everyone and say, would you like to build an ADU? Um, but yeah, I, I don't have that information. For you. I wish we, I, I wish we uh, did. Um, so it seems that we're mostly in agreement about this. Uh, I don't think we need to vote if we're going to vote on this whole plan no because i'll make changes and then yeah. vote as a as a okay. total okay so everybody's in agreement on that okay all right thank you all right moving on and a lot of a lot of it is around that mm -hmm. um so susan i don't know if you want me to answer yours no, I think there you did. Okay. Um, I think the responses we already talked about there. That we skipped home occupation oh. question. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Will home occupation require any type of any type of permit? Uh, is retail allowed in home occupation? Uh, well, let's answer the first one. Uh, will home occupation require any type of permit? Uh, as far as we proposed in the recommendation was no. Um, home occupations would not require a permit in the village. Uh, however, retail is not allowed for home occupation. If you see the definition section 109, home occupation is any non-retail occupation. So any non-retail occupation customarily carried on in a residential area by a resident in their own dwelling place. Home occupations one involve not more than the equivalent of one full time employee, other than the full time residents of the dwelling. Uh, two occupy the, a minor portion, less than fifty percent of the dwelling. Three are the second are secondary to the use of the house as a dwelling. Uh, four do not change the character of the area. Uh, only items produced in the home may be sold from the home, but it also can be sold retail. So, um, anyways. Um, and then your third question was, how does that increase housing? So my answer to that was allowing home occupations by right rather than requiring a permit does not directly increase the amount of housing, but it does reduce the need for folks who potentially move to Woodstock or have switched to remote work um, to have to apply for a, a permit. And Simple idea there, just say, say. Okay, and do we require a permit now for home occupations? Uh, we do out, outside of the, we do have some exemptions, which are further down. I might have to minimize everyone. Stephen, how many home occupation permit requests do you get? Uh, I have not gotten a single one yeah. since, since being here. Yeah. Um, That said, I know a lot of people you know, work from home and have home right. type of businesses. There it is, um, 14 exempt home occupation. So we had a home occupation is exempt from these regulations. So not more than one. So, so yeah, it would be not more than one employee in addition to the owner of the business. No client on site, uh, no signs, no deliveries, office use only. Um, so Laura, I think that's a good question. Um, what I could suggest if we wanted to remove home occupation from requiring a permit and just have by right, we include these other things in the definition. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. It sounded like you were doing um, as yep. you were explaining it. 
So instead yeah, of having so, it so be it exemptions, that. we'll put it in the definition and say, this is how we define home occupation. And so anything outside of, of this definition requires a permit. Yep. So the, the other thing as well that I, I actually didn't know until talking with Sally Miller about this is that unlike the town, so the town actually has a, a definition of a home enterprise. So a home enterprise is essentially a home occupation, but it's a little larger. Um, so a home enterprise resembles a little bit more of an actual business um, in a residential area. And so that's a, that's more burdensome. That's talking about more parking, more things. So we can still have like, hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a home enterprise, that we define that and say, look, home occupation doesn't require a permit. This is what a home occupation is. If you do this, you don't need a permit. But if you do bigger than this, called a home enterprise, that is when you have to have a conditional use approval. So what's the downside of continuing with a permit for home occupation? I don't know that there's a downside. It's more so, is it necessary to continue? I guess I'm, I'm picking up a neighbor who um, had people come to her home to do um, massage therapy. And you know, the neighbors were told about it. And I, I think it keeps things in check. If we didn't know what was going on and cars were coming and going on a regular basis, um, I don't know, it might be a little unsettling. It might have to involve neighbor asking neighbor. But if you know that she was permitted to do this, um, it seems more legit, easier to handle. I tend, to agree. I tend to agree. And I, I'd also like to understand. Um, there are people out there that will try and take whatever we have written and maybe interpret it a different way. And who's then taking a look at these things and enforcing them? And do we have an enforcement even to follow up to make sure that people are following kind of the rules that are laid out here in the town plan? Was that a question towards me? Maybe or anyone, but maybe yeah, towards you guys. Well, yeah. I, I would also agree with you though. Just people do take advantage, but if they know they've gone through a permit for a certain thing, it's harder to take advantage, or you're maybe less likely. I would hope. Right. Yeah. So I guess um, my question. I have a question, which is just that: like, is this an issue of just like transparency? within the permitting process and allowing folks to see what permits have been issued or is this an issue of of permitting and enforcement does that make sense if we're like talking about those two things who are you asking you're asking me I, I, <laughs> yeah <Again>. asking, <laughs> asking the group <laughs> okay i'm gonna go grab my charger oh okay <laughs> He's grabbing his charger. Um, it's not really enforcement, but I think it gives neighbors a chance to say what's on their mind. They know what's going on by a permit being required or being notified that a permit's been requested. Yeah. See, that's exactly how I feel about ADUs. They be involved. I completely agree. Which is why we've switched to a permit, which will get notification. I think that's right. I mean, everyone should know what's happening. Yeah. But that's well, different than not allowing them. <laughs> right. But I, yeah. I think we we're getting away from the whole yeah. noticing of the, of, the, of the abutters. That's what I heard. And so I think you're getting away from involving the neighbors uh, in the ADUs. And, and so I, I do agree with you, uh, Susan Boston. I, I, do, I do think that... Um, it's an interesting issue you raised, and and I I know who you're talking about, <laughs> and so yeah, I mean I I think I think knowing that um, there isn't like an illicit purpose going on in this house, uh, <laughs> yes, I I I agree. Any 
Anyone else? Where are we on this? Where do we think we should go? Uh, well, let me ask another question. Um, now that I've heard everyone, is this so? Do we think this is more about keeping at keeping it just as is, or is it more so um, better defining what a home occupation is, um, and then adding in a, a definition of of what a home enterprise or you can call it something else. We don't have to call it a home enterprise. It's just like the easy, that's the easy term because the town already has it. Because um, uh, how, how many of you work from home for yourself? Um, so, I mean, have you guys filed a home occupation permit <laughs> in your village? Okay. Yeah, I, so, so the point is, is I, I don't remember who asked. I think it was Frank, how do you enforce it? I, I, I don't really have so the administrative officer is tasked with enforcing this um i don't i don't have a way to do it and i would say probably 60 percent of the the people that i have met that have moved here in the last two years work from home um so anyways it's i'm alluding to more of like well what if those deliveries are actually happening? And what if there are actually visitors coming in, coming and going? And, you know, it is starting to cause a disturbance, right? So then who is, who's watching that? Or who does then the neighbor then call to say, hey, I don't think that they're meeting a criteria that we all agreed on? Yeah, they, they would call our office to say, hey, this looks more like a home enterprise than a home home occupation yeah so then I maybe, mean, if, if it's maybe, a we do define, maybe we do define i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off Stephen. maybe we do define the home occupancy uh and then still require a permit though but maybe the permit's a simple piece of paperwork I so another option oh I just think it's going to be important. You asked the question, how many work from home? Working from home is not the same as a home occupation, at least not in my mind. If you bring work home from the office or you're remote from another business, that is not a home occupation. That's someone working from home. That's like if you, that you, could, so you could say, oh, a teacher who brings home tests to grade for their third graders, that's a home occupation. It's not. It's working from home. So I think that's the clarification we need to make. You know, most people moving to Woodstock are working remotely, many of them for another company. And that's not a home occupation as far as I understand the definition, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? No, I, I would agree with that. I, so I, I love that concept. Yeah, and I don't think anyone should have a permit for that. I mean, that's getting really into what's going on in your like in your four walls, and and yeah, I don't, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Agreed. So, um, suggestion there is we keep we keep the home occupation um, as in I think, I think typically an administrative permit. Uh, but maybe we, I give a try at the definition of a home occupation, maybe creating a, a new exemption for what is remote work, uh, defining remote work. So, so essentially what I'm saying is, is we have the home occupation permit process stays the same, but we may decide that we want to expand the exemptions for, for very small home occupation processes. I like that. I do too. Yeah. Everyone else agree with that? Yeah. Even, yeah. May I, yeah. So, okay. Laura? Okay. Great. Okay. So I guess we just make that note. Okay. 
So skip the over. Oh, that was Mary what, Margaret's a concern on home occupations. Look above, uh, there was a thing about the character survey. Character so what, survey. what I know, what my comment. Your comment. Character survey. Um, enabling better places suggests doing a character survey. And I just, we're changing the zone, eight different zoning districts. And um, I'm not sure we need to do it in every single one. I guess what my point was, because we didn't really look at all of the zones in person. We didn't, I think it might have been a good idea to do some kind of a site review of all this. But that's just very broad, big suggestion. I couldn't help but say it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, again, that kind of goes back to some of the things is, is that. I think we will continue to work and shape some of these things. Um, I think what we were approached by Two Rivers and the EDC Housing Group and some of these other fringe groups that we've been working with was just the idea of they specifically said, here's the low hanging fruit. Please go after these things. And so that's where we kind of focused on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I generally agree with you. I want to continue to do more surveys. I want to review some more of the setbacks. Um, I want to have unlimited time to look at. I think Susan, you mentioned somewhere, and and my response is like, I, I would love to have like the cat ability to just like sit and build renderings of potential. You know, look at everywhere we could fit an ADU um, under our current regulations and, and these proposed ones, and then just present that, because um, that would be awesome. Uh, Susan and Mary Margaret, do you remember when the person from Montpelier attended one of our meetings? Yeah. And they did a lot of zoning changes, but they looked at every neighborhood. They broke them down into small pieces and saw that in many areas, everything was non-conformant. So it was very, very easy to change the zoning there. Um, you know, you know, I they, don't know how they, how did they pay for that? Who did they had an AmeriCorps volunteer. So, uh, um, so that, you know, and it's fair, it was fairly standardized and, and what they looked at and they have GIS. So they were able to, to run, you know, a program on GIS, I think pretty easily to compare the maps was built area and unbuilt area. And um, I think there were 38 neighborhoods they broke it down. Some of them are only yeah. a block, you know, but they were also looking at a whole, the, the, the wholesale zoning change. They were looking at changes in density, height, um, distance, you know, setbacks, a uh, whole, whole, whole scale. And um, that, is very different than what we're trying to do here. But it would be lovely if we had some kind of AmeriCorps, you know, Vista, Vista, I think, um, to do to do some work. Wouldn't you love that, Stephen? Yeah, I'd, I'd take like four or five of them. Uh, is there a place where we can keep ideas like this, um, you know, to come back to? Because I, I, I think Susan um, Boston is putting forth a great idea, you know, to do a character survey. And it would be great to have, you know, just have like a running list, you know, of things that either we come back to as a committee at a certain point, or if we do have an opportunity for an AmeriCorps or VISTA um, person, you know, that we have a, a ready list to draw from. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, so that character survey specifically, that's, so once we kind of get through, you know, we've been talking about the whole, like, I want to do the 24 month full revamp of the town plan where we really dive into every part of it. And that character survey would would be, would really be something that I'd like to do. Because um, I think that we would find out a lot of our, our, our zoning districts are, are somewhat scattered even within the village where we could probably condense some of that and say, okay, you might be able to do a little bit different things, but essentially here's the village, like village center one or like mixed use one, like mixed use two and you know outside of a couple other things we we just simplify a lot of it 
right, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put that character study out there for them. Um, so Mary Margaret's comment there says, see note above in home occupations. I don't know what her note above. I, I think I think we've ad addressed that. Okay. We, yeah, right. we've, it's the same issue that, you know, we've, yeah, we just talked through. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So this is just general setbacks and wanting to know. Yeah, again, it's it's similar to the character study. You know, if we're changing yeah. these setbacks, and like this one, I don't know what section it is, but um, residential high density, maybe Fine. we're changing it from twenty five to fifteen. Well, if every house is twenty five, fifteen, you know, or is twenty five, the side and the rear, is that going to be a little awkward to now have fifteen? Is that going to look out of place? If every house is set back from the street a certain distance and we put one house much closer to the road, it kind of doesn't have the flow that I think it should have. Again, yeah. this would benefit from a character sur survey. So we know how, what are the general setbacks? I mean, most this, of the houses yeah. in certain neighborhoods have the same setback. Do we know that the for you know the shorter setback is going to be okay? Now, there aren't a lot of empty lots either. So it's not as if it's going to be a you know one close to the road, one far. Um, but I think continuity is important. I think it it really affects our streetscapes. I don't know what we do. Hmm. Well. I just want to add, I mean, you know, obviously the village has grown up over hundreds of years uh, with no zoning for most of that. And so it's kind of hard to define what character is. And, you know, just walking through the village a couple of weeks ago, um, there's hardly any street where there's consistency about where the buildings are. And you might say that the character is things are different. <laughs> But I think that's not completely true everywhere, although it's more true some places than others. And it would indeed be useful even to have a quick photographic survey down streets on both sides to say, look, you know, we are back front. So if you're arguing about maintaining character, we don't know what character you want to maintain. Because other than the, the kind of the varied nature of what happens in historic places over time, you know, with infill and changes, particularly when it was, you know, the Wild West, there were no, there were no zoning rules. Um, I don't know, again, this is an issue of capacity, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would like to have all of that. I, I mean, even thinking about going back to the, to the GIS potential of having current setbacks, and then being able to shade all of that, um, so if I could just enter in the setbacks that we currently have, shade that out as non-developable land, and then put on the next layer of, okay, what's on steep slope, what's in the ridge line, um, and just look at the village and then be able to like highlight bright yellow. This is the, this is the area within each parcel that could actually fit a, say, a, a footprint of a, of a 2,400 square foot house or, or an 1,800 square foot house. Know, something like that. Um, it 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 could be done, and it's it's really not that difficult to do. I just need someone to to be able to volunteer their time and do it. So, are we, is everybody okay with these proposed setbacks? What what is section three hundred four three hundred three three hundred four is low density? I think this is where we first start. One acre. Residence one acre. And I don't have my map. Where is that, Jonathan? Is that uh, River Street, uh, Mount Nav? Uh, Mount Nav and River. And maybe uh, up on Lincoln Street. Well, Lincoln has a lot of uh, yeah. residential homes. Okay. 
All right, is everybody okay with me? Change the back. We're changing front from 50 to, to what, 35? Rear and side from 25 to 15. I'm not sure what we're doing with the front. Can you just scroll down to the other, are there any other comments directly on this? Um, my comments related to the ADU, it's not on the subject. So I think, and Susan, your comments are, are kind of, again, it would be nice to have that, that full survey. Um, but I think when we're defending this, if we have a public hearing that there are people saying, you can't change that to 15 to 25, 25 works. Uh, how can we say it? 15 is gonna be okay. Cause I don't really well, know. That's why I'd like to, I'd like to, between now and our, our whenever we have that hearing, I, I would absolutely like to, to do at least as much as possible to I think try and could, do a, yeah. a, a mini survey. Right, right. Um, at least know the general areas where each, where each zoning area is and know what it, what it generally is. So I have a proposal and I don't know if this is like counts as a public meeting if we're surveying and we're not deliberating. I'm wondering who's available this weekend to go take a walk with our cameras. I'm really serious. And just uh, to I would have that, I am away for your way. And but, just um, take a walk with our cameras and do some just to, you know, take simple pictures that can go up in a slideshow and just not deliberate, but just survey. <laughs> yep. And two people can get together. I'm I'm willing to take a walk with my camera if anyone would like to join. It would have to be Saturday or Sunday morning. I'm free, Susan, and I need to walk this baby out. So <laughs> I'm I'm more than happy to join. Great. All right. I will connect. We're not going to deliberate, but we will we will survey anyone else who wants to join. We'll, Laura, why don't we connect after this meeting and then we'll send an email to everyone of when we're going to take a walk. Sounds good. Um, I just think it's really important not to make assumptions. And I, I think there aren't as many. I think there are lots of inconsistencies, which is how towns develop. Um, thanks for doing that. That's great. I, I just have a question. Uh, um, uh, I, I've lost the reason why um, we're making this change and what it will gain. Like what what will anyone gain from this? Um, I mean, it's not gonna affect housing um, or maybe it will. Yeah, the hope that, that it will affect housing, um, just enough to say, if you if you have a lot that is large enough, but not, you know, if you if you have ten feet on okay. either side, Got it. Um, yep. that you'll be able to potentially subdivide and and have someone else build another home next to you. Um, hopefully, again, maintaining the character. Um, but the idea is is to to create more parcels so we in, increase the density. And so, and also, or if you want to build an ADU rather than having to have, you know, 25 feet to the rear, if you were able to have 15 feet to the rear, that that may be, in, in all cases, that, that won't give you enough room. Um, in some cases, you didn't need the extra anyways, so it doesn't matter. Um, and again, this is, this, this isn't going to change it overnight. You know, everyone's not going to, I'm not expecting everyone to go, I've got 10 more feet to the side setback. I'm going to build that that other house that I've always been thinking about. Um, but it might it might change it for for some people. Um, and I know that simply from having conversations with people that have come to my office and say, "Hey, we're thinking about building ADU because um, our parents want to move here or whatever the situation is." 
and we walk through it and say, well, because you're on this slope and this side, and because you can't meet the setback, um, you either have to you have to shave it down or attach it to your house or whatever. And they go, ah, well, I mean, we'll we'll look at other options. I mean, it could be say a, a ranch on a, a lot on on our street, which might have a very you know a bigger lot. You could put a wing on it to make it a two family. Um, and get that much closer to the property line. Does this affect sheds and garages detached? These, these setbacks? Yes. So a, a garage could also get that much closer to the property. Correct. Okay. So with the thought of even if you're building a garage or a shed, that leaves you more room to potentially build a meeting or something like that. So, so essentially it, it's providing the potential for more land to become more dense. Yep. And again, this is this is very incremental. Yes, it is. Um, okay, any other questions on that? Mary Margaret, did that, did that cover the yeah. Is everybody comfortable with these setbacks that we've established here in the, these couple of zones? Okay. When you say comfortable, do you mean an agreement with changing the setbacks? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm not. I, I don't know. Yeah. Without knowing more, I, I would not be. Um, Nico, what Nico, what else would you be looking to know? I, I just I don't know what the character is, and I, I just in my mind die if 10 feet's making that big of a difference and it is getting crammed in there to begin with. And that again gets right into my initial concern, especially as we are eliminating abutting property owners from being part of the process with hearings. Um, I don't know. It's just may maybe I'm overly. Would, would this require notifying the butters? These kind of changes, these setback changes, if someone. So the to... setback change, the zoning regulation change of these setbacks, you have to notify the whole town. Right. Yeah. But if so. someone's building an addition onto their home, not even related to a. Just an addition. No, just an administrative permit process. Okay. So same as that was same. required. Okay. For so a notice would be posted. Yeah. Do we move on? Uh, is, I don't, I don't, what we is, do? Have you ever um, reached out to like BLS and dealt with like the land use clinic over there or anything like that to get some volunteer hours to help out at all? Yeah, uh, so they no longer have the the land use clinic. I think my my class was like the last one that, that actually Lovely. went through like the the land use clinic itself. Um, they have people that somewhat focus on that, but yeah, they're getting much more away from land use and, and focusing on different areas. Incredible. Yeah, I know. Um, it's unfortunate because I, yeah, that's why I really. But I still keep in regular touch with them, um, and and Professor uh, Milne, who uh, or Milne, who who I'm hoping will send me people that may want an externship that mm -hmm. fall in love with land use. But yeah, I think in general there's less people going to BLS um, for for the land use specialty than than there once was. Mm. But. Good idea. Not writing it off. Just uh, just not as not as easy as it it once was. Maybe. Um, okay, uh, Susan. I think that kind of talks to, to what we were talking about before. Um, same turn that we talked about home location. Okay, great. Well, I'll get to this one. Um, what is the purpose of changing building height to 40? Um, do we want three, four story flat roof building rather than two and a half story, which is a standard in our neighborhoods? Susan, I'm really glad you brought this up. Okay. Uh, Sally Miller brought this up when I talked to her as well. Um, so 
40 is, is something that we came from when I was discussing with a handful of different developers about the idea of because people are demanding more space and more height. And also as we as we try and become more dense, the reality of for safety sprinklers um, causing an issue for just the height having to go up. And so that was more of or of a thought for just larger two and a half stories. But I did go back and look at the greater name uh enabling better fix yeah, I looked at that. Um and so I think that we should talk about this because it suggests two and a half stories in neighborhood districts and three and a half stories in town centers and lays out but lays out the maximum parameters of each story because that was my question. Okay, two and a half stories sounds great, but what is how do we define a story? The way they did in that said, ground floor stories exceeding 20 feet are considered two stories. So the first, that means the first, the ground floor can be up to 20 feet. Uh, and that counts as one. Um, so mezzanines, uh, get, never mind. Um, upper stories exceeding 16 feet are counted as two stories, an additional story for every multiple of 16 feet. So I agree with the idea that in the, maybe like more so in the residential medium, residential high, uh, residential office, and maybe like the borderline, the light commercial, that's more where we might say two and a half stories. And say, and we have that definition of, um, that doesn't mean that you can't have mixed use on say like a light commercial, but when we just say up to 20 feet, that's the ground story. So if we go from what they suggest here, you could still have a building that is two and a half stories, but is 44 feet tall, like from, from ground floor to the peak of the roof. Uh -huh. 20 and 16 and eight. Yes. But if we did the two and a half stories, that means that you would still have some sort of peak roof um, rather than saying, the problem is is going up to 40, squeezing in three stories, and then just having a point. And I think that's the concern that you brought up. Um, and I think that's the concern that, that I would have as well. I'm in favor of keeping it. I'm in favor of keeping it at 35 feet. Um, I'd be uh, nervous that this would be a precedent. You know, they'd be taken out into the you know, the R5, um, you know, kind of outside into the to the town area. You know, people are already building gigantic homes out there, and uh, um, I think thirty-five is yeah. I, and I and want, I would... you know, like a you know, I, I mean, we're not going to have more housing for people if we're allowing twenty-foot high first floors. You know that, or, you know, one single floors like that doesn't make any sense. Right. I, I, as far as Increasing, increasing housing. I don't see that. You know, I don't see that that one. Unless you get a larger attic, you can put an apartment. Does so anyone have any other input? Or I guess I just have a question, which is just that, like, I think. <laughs> It makes more sense to do this in, in stories and in, instead of feet, but maybe I'm, I mean, again, not having any, maybe you, Stephen or Susan could speak to if that's like a common community industry standard to have stories instead of feet, because, because I think that makes more sense in this particular case, but. I think traditionally it's, it's been measured by a maximum of feet, but I, I, I think the the trend is going towards stories and then just defining what a story means. And just because we say, 20, so I, I do want to clarify that that is just what in the neighborhood district they said was that up to 20 feet. We, we don't necessarily have to follow that. Um, so I think the idea is keeping the two and a half story would, would preserve more of the two stories with the peak roof rather than even at 35 feet, when we just say 35 feet, you still risk having a, just a flat roof. Um, so, I don't know. 
Susan, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you, I mean, you, you basically said it. I, I, I think uh, you do have to put some kind of height limit, you know, a story, but I, I think you explained it, Stephen. Okay. It seems like doing it by stories would be more limiting, you know, to someone who wanted to be a creative builder. You know, if you're saying you can only have your story, one story this high, one story that high, one story that high, you know, rather than allowing some creativity and capping what, we really care about, which is the overall height of the building. Like, I don't care if somebody wants, you know, a, you know, five, you know, six foot high, you know, flat, whatever. I don't care what they do inside their house. I, I, what I, I care about is, you know, the overall height of the building. Anyone else have thoughts on this? I completely agree. Okay, and do we I feel- agree. However, again, you know, it, it comes down to how many people are doing this. The cost of building has risen 20 to 40% over the past two years. I just don't see anyone going ahead and doing a 20 foot, 20 foot first floor. I think that would be insane and expensive. So how does this all really apply? I mean, I, I would agree with you, Frank, in most places, but, you know, Woodstock is attracting people who do have the means to be able to build whatever. Um, money is not an object to a lot of people who are, you know, who are moving here. Uh, my feeling is it's just one more change we're adding here, and it's not directly increased in housing. Um. So my, my next thing that, that I'm going to ask is, so we have central commercial, uh, commercial light industrial. Um, so the areas where we would potentially see, like in the East End, like that is where if we were, if we were to see apartments or cluster housing, mm -hmm. like what Nico is talking about, where we have a 40 unit development, um, that's the difference of can we build a two-story apartment or can we build a three-story apartment? That could be the difference of can we do 20 units, can we do 30 units? Mm -hmm. and it still goes through Act 250 and the whole thing. Um, and can then they apply the, for um, a variance? Yeah, but Profession. a variance to the height would be a pretty, pretty high burden because you don't, I mean, that's the one place for you. So 40 feet could be a three-story building? Yes. And I think Brad's actually the one that confirmed that with his construction knowledge. Oh. Well, I mean, when you put it that way, I, I think that that is important. We would love to see the East End develop, and, and that would be an ideal place for apartments, condos. And if that five feet would make that difference there, because I don't think there's very many places for you to add five feet in the village because everything's pretty much already developed. Yeah, potentially. Um, Can you there is certain areas that would be allowed to have 40 feet versus 35? Sorry, say that again, Frank. Could you could you limit, you know, for example, the East End to have a 40 foot height uh, versus the rest of the community having a 35? Yeah, and, and we've done that in the proposed, I want to say we, we can scroll back through, but uh, like residential medium, residential high, I think in residential office, we kept it 35. Um, I'll, I'll check myself after, after this, um, but we increased it to 40 in um, central commercial, commercial light industrial and light commercial. And does that include East End? Yes. So almost the whole East End is, is uh, commercial light industrial. Okay. So we could leave it at 35 in the more established areas of the building. Yeah, another option too is if we like the two and a half, if we like the two and a half stories idea in the residential medium, I mean, we could decrease. We, we don't have to have 20 feet just simply because that's what they suggest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we could decrease that to where it's two and a half stories and the highest that it could be is still 35 feet. Okay. Um, 
well, enabling better places uses the two and a half for you. And, and what are we talking about? Three and a half for town center. Right. What is actually at 35 feet? Is it the the height of that that third floor? The or is it the peak, peak of, of the roof? roof? Okay. Yeah. Or the flat roof, if it's. So flat I think roof. what we need to do is make sure that this 40 foot or the, the story with the first floor being limited. Should apply only in those commercial, commercial light industrial areas, and not in the high density or medium density, not in the established. Would folks agree with that? Okay. So again, are we drafting to keep it up at? Keep it at feet, or are we wanting to change it to stories and then adjust the stories? I like the stories. Okay. So, what do others feel about that? I mean, as long as it includes a cap of feet, great. Yeah. Okay. Which we can also do. I mean, we could we could say that the ground floor, you know, over blank amount of feet counts as a second floor, um, and then upper upper floors we just don't have it we have it less than 20 less than 16 and then we can just say does not does not go over 35 feet um now that is specific to residential medium residential high residential low and residential office and then are we doing different are we doing three and a half stories for the commercial commercial light industrial and light commercial yeah, I, I think so. And what do we do? We have a, a height limit for that. Do we want to keep? Do we want to have that at forty or forty five? What are they recommending? Well, they they so for town centers, they recommend three and a half stories, yep. or that's the example they give with the same ground floor twenty, um, upper floor sixteen. So, but for for commercial like industrial and, and like the East End, that would be more where we would have, like you would potentially have a, a higher first floor simply because that that's yeah. where you'd have like a retail or a, or a restaurant or like something like that, um, or offices mm -hmm. and, and up above is where you'd have apartments. Oh, I'm comfortable with that. How about others? Not so are we saying we're ca sorry are we saying for the commercial <laughs> districts we're capping it at stories but also in feet and the feet would be 20 plus 16 plus another half story which is eight is that what we're saying so it's like so am i, I, am I just like making for, numbers up no no, no. residential sorry. medium so for the more residential ones the, yeah the, so residential medium, high, low, RO, yep, R1. Uh, R1, R3, we keep at two and a half stories, but we, I don't know what, the, we could do that math really quick, but essentially we, we'd have it to where your first, your first floor, if, let's say the first floor is, is 12 or 13 or 15 feet, and the second floor would be 10 feet, and then, eight, you know, whatever that would be. But the idea is the maximum amount for a two and a half story would not exceed 35 feet. Right. Okay. But then in the in the commercial, like central commercial, commercial light industrial, um, and light commercial, the more mixed, the mixed use, more town center, right. you follow the three and a half stories where we have, maybe that's where we have the, I don't know. We we don't have a cap necessarily on the on what the footage is we just have the three and a half stories well the, but we need to define uh, what a story is do we not well okay. the enabling better places has a building in a town center well east end is a little different but, but would apply 
three and a half story building height. And then it goes into more detail. 20 feet is exceeding 20 feet is considered two stories. Mezzanine, you know, it's got all these little suggestions. Upper stories exceeding 16 feet are counted as two stories. So it, it, it does limit. So say you can go up to 20 on the first floor. You can right, and then you can go up to 16 on the second floor and second 16 floor. on the third floor. Right, and half of that on the third floor. No, another 16 on the third. And then right, so that's 60. That that's 60 feet, feet though, right, yeah. total? So that's a total of- you, you Six zero? Have, yes. Yes. That's the maximum start. amount. What's the highest building in the town center right now? Great question. Uh, well, it's gotta be that sunset building, right? That's, that's pretty- That's a big one. That's probably the biggest one in town. That, yeah. But I think, I think, Mary Marie, I don't wanna cut in, but I think your next, that building might be over 60 feet or might be 60 feet. So I think what, what we're getting at is, is 60 feet does seem pretty pretty high. Yeah, it seems high um, to me. So if we, but if we did, let's say if we knocked it down to allow 20 for the first floor, 13, 13 um, and yeah. this really wouldn't have a six and a half half floor. Oh, but yeah. that would be stored for commercial potentially. Um, how many does uh, Nico? Do you work in Sunset Farms? How many floors do you guys have there? Yeah, we have the basement floor, which is a restaurant. So I don't know if you count that or not. And then we have uh, four additional floors. Okay. So no, we would not count the the basement. It, it's from from, from the level. street. Yeah. I mean, so typically, I believe well, what street? Basement. What street? Yeah, I know. I mean, it's different on the street side of that. There's building. two it's streets. To the typically, side. typically, how height is measured in terms of the basement is that if more than fifty percent of the basement is above ground, it is considered habitable space on the floor. And if there's a change in level, you do an average around the building. And if more than half of it, more than half of the building is 50% above, then you take a percentage of the floor. Ah, oh, thank you, Susan. So in Sunset Farms, the back is kind of walkout to the, is to the parking lot. So that would be considered habitable. That would be considered like count towards your floor. But if the so front wasn't, like building. if that was all utility area and building systems, you wouldn't count that. I think you so can be pretty sure, <laughs> you, you know, I, I think you can be pretty sure with height, particularly in a commercial area that whatever you build, they will come. You know, Washington DC has a height of 12 stories and every single building is built to the limit of 12 stories. Uh -huh. Why wouldn't you? Um, so, you know, and I, I I don't think that's a bad thing, but I just think we can assume for the most part that this will be maxed out. Okay, so so what is a what is a max that we would recommend to the trustees as a, as an okay? Um, we get we can do three and a half stories and then we can do the calculation like we will with the residential of, of how to make that work. Seems like we think 60 is too much, mm -hmm. is, is 50 too much. I, I guess we, we should know what is a, an apartment building, what is typical um, like you, you stared at is, is roughly somewhere around 13 feet. 
Okay. If you, if you allow the... for structure for HVAC systems and they put building, you know, ceiling height, yeah, you're probably looking floor to floor minimum yeah. of like 12 feet floor to yeah. floor. Commercial buildings are usually more. You know, yeah. I don't feel like I have enough information to make those judgments. You know, we all say Sunset Farms is too large, but it is there, right? So this <laughs> whole argument for existing character, you know, I mean, it, it is already there. You know, obviously people have offices in it, it's useful. And I would make an argument that as a gateway to the town, I mean, our gateways are really weak and, and particularly in that direction totally coming agree. in. And, and so, you know, as an argument for, you know, if we if we take what Nico is talking about as like not disturb the village center, there'd be an argument for allowing more height and density at the edges. And I think there's also an argument not to push everything all the way out, because in all of my planning work, all of the public safety officials, the police, the fire, the ambulance say stop putting all of the density of elderly housing and affordable housing on the edges of town, because we get a lot of calls, particularly for elderly, and it's very inefficient for the way yeah. our services are set up. And so, you know, you could argue that the edge there could create a stronger gateway. You already have one thing there. So I, I'm not sure if this is a blanket solution. But we do benefit from the emergency services building being yeah. in the East End. That's right, exactly. Right, but, but I, I just think, you know, there's some argument to be made for building up some character there that's kind of missing. It, well, exactly. Oh. That that new emergency service building has no character. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was implying. I mean, it just kind of dribbles out, right? I mean, it just yeah. kind of all dribbles out. It's 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 a that's a tough. And you've got the gas stations coming in, which we all need and use. But you know, if there's anywhere that could support a bit more, it's certainly that uh, area. There's another building that that is. Uh, fairly attractive is the the terrace. I wonder how many floors that is. How tall that is. Oh, the terrace. I think something like that in the east end would be well, it is in the east end, but uh, something similar. Could so work Susan, Susan Silberg made the point that she didn't have have enough information. I hopefully I'm not. Um, I'm paraphrasing correctly, and I feel the same way. I feel like this conversation is a little arbitrary. You know, uh, just yeah. say, well, how about this or how about that? I think we right. need to do a little more work on it. And I don't know if it's the fact that it's late, um, you know, <laughs> or, you know, approaching two hours um, for this meeting or 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 what. But I would I would vote to circle back to this after we have some more inform, you know, after we have some more information. I want to, yeah, I want to support this. I mean, there are urban design standards for these kinds of things. You know, I'm, I'm thinking I need to pull my book, Great Streets. You know, I mean, we should be aspiring to great streets in Woodstock, you know, and mm -hmm. and yeah. there's a ratio of height to width of street. You know, what are the uses? We have precedents all over the world that tell us, you know, not just big cities, but little towns, like places we all want to go and visit and be, what those ratios should be. And I just think we need a little more study. Laura, maybe this this weekend, if you really want to walk that baby out, we can we can we can just take a look at kind of what's there on the edges and, yeah. and just try to bring back some information to, to, to right. all of us. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I was also wondering if some of that lives on the um I was just trying to see if it lives on the property cards that are online too, because that mm -hmm. might be a good way to collect that data. But yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. I think it's a good. I think it's a good idea to circle back as well um, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one, you know, are there certain properties that could, you know, sustain a four and a half story property? You know, down a couple properties down from sunset for example where there's mm -hmm. two and a half stories that show up on woodstock road but maybe it's there's a whole full floor below grade that's facing ottaquichi river right so is there room to say there's certain properties that allow it or um do we say there's a certain section of east end that allows for maybe a higher story versus the rest of the village so i yeah. think we should definitely circle back yeah, and I don't think we can zone spot zone property by property. I think we're going to have to find like an area and say this is the kind of character we're encouraging here. 
the kind of density we, you know, we're trying to encourage affordability. Um, so yeah, agreed, Frank. Yeah, I think the East End has a really big opportunity that we can support um, if we are smart about it. Yeah, I just got to get water there. That four inch pipe isn't going to cut it. Oh, yeah. Where do, we do we have a cost? Of course we don't. We're Woodstock. Did we lose Nico? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll keep moving. Okay. Uh, intern, administrative review. Um, hey, Margaret, if um, oh, if one whole household okay. building is prohibited in central commercial, then ADU one household building should be right. Um, I said I, th there is a scenario where an existing one or two household building would have, you know, maybe desire to build an ADU. Um, but, you know, I, I looked at it today and I, th I think that that certain scenario would maybe affect four parcels. I, I think my point on that is that if you look at C, prohibited uses, one household building is prohibited. And then so in B, uses not requiring a permit, it says yeah. one household. Yeah, so take out the one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's the whole idea thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awkward wording. Okay. That that is awkward wording. I don't know that it was any less. I tried to define that what is the 60% of the lot because the 60% of the lot does that does that include uh after setbacks or buffers? So that that's I, I can I can take another another shot at how to make that less awkward. That's what I was trying to include. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, Susan, answer your question. There are two single household buildings in LC. One is 53 Pleasant that is currently under construction um, that has an ADU in the back. Uh, we oh, become, yeah. So they would become non-conforming structures, and that only becomes a problem if they change their use at some point. So say for some reason they they, they can lose and then Wait, later back on to they want to yeah. Okay. So they opened up a an office, change it, and then they want to say, "Yeah, somebody else comes along and says, I want. They can't go back to the house. Well, they oh, can't no. go back to a single family. Single family. Okay. They would have to figure out how to split. So and how many did you say? There's just two? There's two. I, I guess we don't need to that. I would. And technically, the other one is the Wasps building. Oh. Um, yeah. That's still technically on the 2020 grand lists. And the residential, residential one. Okay. So, I don't know the last time anyone used it, but okay. Why how are you using cash required? Oh, it was, I don't remember where that is. Talked about floors. Last one. Uh, why include, uh, why allow ADU to be half required setback uh, within that district? Uh, my answer to that was just again, the, the point is to increase the density. The village allows such waivers under Section 502 for other accessory structures. Um, that may not be relevant after after we've talked about it. I don't. I don't know, Mary Margaret, if, if you have more to say on that. I mean, I think um, I, I'm feeling like I should channel Nico a little bit since he's not here. <laughs> You'd probably object to this. Um, but yeah, I don't really see the point to uh, having an exemption for an ADU for half that setback. If they need to get a variance, they can get a variance, but um, I think the setbacks should be the setbacks. Um, so Especially because you're impinging I'm, somebody's backyard. But I, I'm actually going to say I agree with Mary Margaret. I, I And part of this is just about understanding change is difficult. And if we're a bit more incremental in these changes, I think we have a better chance of 
of getting them implemented. And that is a change. It seems reasonable to me that you wouldn't waive this for ADUs, given the other concerns. Okay, any any other input? Anyone? Okay, uh, that was all parking changes, having the presentation. Uh, yeah, I mean, parking is, we're gonna hash that out. We, we don't have the perfect plan for parking. I don't see that as a, as a reason not to change the parking and let the market figure it out. Um, um, so I think that there is a reason why we would talk to the businesses and the EDC before we make a decision on this, because if we want, if we want to have input, we want to have a good conversation about this to understand what their concerns are so that if, if we propose this, we know we have support and that we're not going to get pushed back for things that we just haven't considered. Um, and I think that's just the good policy as the planning commission. So I don't know, I have not talked to anyone on the EDC about this. Um, Susan, have you? I haven't talked to anybody. Um, and I, I, and I, I, yeah. I can just hear Jeff and Tom with the with the parking when it gets to the uh, trustees. I think. Well, we, that's always going to be a problem. Yeah. For the I don't know if we give them a heads up or. I don't know. So, so I, we have a suggestion different than what's proposed where we keep it and where we go from two to one in some areas and then eliminate it completely in others. What if we so just we... eliminated an, any additional parking required for an ADU? Because we're looking, we're really looking at a small number of ADUs, and right now that is where the problem is. As a first step, and then coming back um, regarding um, kind of looking at other things. I, I don't know. I'm looking at an incremental approach to keep us moving uh, while we gather. I guess, well, we, we have feedback. I don't know if that's the right approach. Who has so other I, ideas? I, I just want to clarify what, what you're saying is keep it at two, except not for the ADUs. No, that I would be- you said Keep it at one, didn't you? Or We could do one. I just don't think- um, So one for all village districts, which would still be a, we, right now we are at two. So we'd be cutting it in half if we went to one in all the other districts. I think we can't, I think we, if our goal right now is to get ADUs built and to, to minimize the barriers, and we have more than anecdotal evidence of ADUs that have not been able to be built because we haven't, because there hasn't been space for another parking. It seems to me that at the very least, our goal should be to say, if you build an ADU, you don't have to provide an additional parking space, but not mess with any of the other parking requirements for the moment until we have really talked through a bigger plan. In other words, could, could lots become available, municipal lots for rental overnight if people need them in the off season? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think this is, is indeed going to have an impact on the village. And the question is how much? Well, in our previous conversations, I, I think that was that was the point is that we mm -hmm. have that it will have an impact on the on the village. And the fact that uh, people that come in the office and say, I'm not going to build above Coburn's because I can't provide I can't provide the parking uh, anywhere that I need to. Um, you know, the, I don't know, uh, the, the way that we had talked about this previously as a, as a group was was eliminate the, the parking requirement in, in most dense areas and reduce to one in the more residential areas. And then because we want to let the market figure it out. We um, do. So here's a question. Is it only for new construction? In other words, um, 
or does this apply? In other words, if I if I had an apartment building and had managed to have one parking space available, I'm just throwing something out. We passed this. Could I take my parking lot in the back, take away all the parking for existing, you know, tenants and I don't know, build another building? Technically, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think we definitely want to encourage the, we definitely want to encourage more apartment construction. We do not want a parking requirement to slow that down. We think that the market will indeed take care of it. So I think what we have to answer is, are those people going to be taking up street spaces during the day that customers need? for stores, right? That's kind of simplifying it, but that's the answer, right? And that's I think that's where we hit the, the, we take the soccer ball back to the EDC and say, hey, your turn solving. Now you try and figure out while, you know, your EDC, the, the housing group comes from the EDC, which suggested these things to us. And now it's like, okay, now go back to the EDC, tell them what we've done and put it now on the, on the EDC. Maybe they create a new parking committee. That, that tries to figure out how the market can can solve the commercial parking from. Um, so I think we I just we have think to... it's good policy to reach out now, right? Just in the way is that we would not want, uh, we don't want people, I think we all want to communicate. We're going to have the best solution to a kind of efficient, effective government if everybody is communicating. I yeah, agree. Um, I, I think I think I think it would be important to to loop them in now specifically about this. Um, so I guess one one thing we could support is saying yes, we hold we hold by this of um, we have to decide what we're holding by. Is it cutting it in half to one? You know, um, an AD is nothing, and and. Um, but we want to reach out. That's kind of part of our our position. Now we want to just reach out. I don't know if that's kind of going backwards. So how 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 would we feel about just if we if we kept this as is for tonight? Because we're we're not voting on these tonight. And I said um, I can I can forward what we're proposing to the EDC and say, hey, at your next meeting, I'd love to come. Um, if any of you. Are, are able to come and just say, can you give us a slot in 10 minutes to talk about what we're proposing? And then we'll pass it on for you to discuss. Please get us your feedback by, mm -hmm. I don't know, sometime before we have our next hearing. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, and then that's other than um, I didn't have a specific response to this. I think I just I, I just wanted to flag this because I didn't remember discussing removing it. Um, Mary Margaret, I, to be honest, I, I don't think I meant to remove it. Um, I don't know. I don't I don't remember specifically removing it. So All right. I don't. I'll just leave it there. I don't see one. I don't, I don't know how many in the village are going to have driveways over 500 feet, but if they if they did, I'd have no problem with this. Um, so we're going to keep that. We'll keep that. Yeah. Okay. All right, Greg. Well, we made it through to the next round. Um, thanks, everybody who made suggestions or had questions. Um, everybody comfortable moving? beyond that now all right susan um, susan i'm not sure I, i'm not gonna be able to last too much longer yeah. okay <laughs> sorry yeah so do we, there's one thing that we should probably talk about is the the town plan and where that is yeah since it's um kind of a surprise that it's not at all put to bed i thought it was so really the only thing you look at is so to make a to make a long story short because we're all fading is that we submitted the town plan to the trustees 
back in October, the trustees and the select board um, met individually to discuss the town plan. Uh, we wrote and approved a report and then Two Rivers at some point after, shortly after the select board and trustees met, gave me some, some just, hey, heads up. We're not gonna be able to uh, approve this with our regional plan if you keep these things in here. Um, and really it was this. So they said, you have to revi revise the future land, land use map to change the CLI district in West Woodstock to become uh, the BSLI um, or they will not give us regional approval. That was it? That's all they wanted us to change? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, so but other where, than- Where did that go? I mean, that meeting was a long time ago. Um, what happened then? And why did we not get that information? We're the planning commission. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of it was, was I mean, a lot of these things were put on hold because we didn't know whether this was still in the best interest of pushing the town plan adoption through because the, the reason that we were being kind of forced to do this was for the benefit of, of a very small group of people that were pushing for the village designation. Um, and so those people had disappeared for some time. We weren't sure whether or not they still wanted to do the village designation. After conversations with both the select board and trustees, um, they said, and I agree, I don't think anything hurts uh, with just going ahead and doing it. Uh, but in general, we don't want to, we don't want to cover up problems in a town plan and not take on the town plan adoption process uh, for the benefit of just a couple of people. So what, why didn't you, I mean, why are we just hearing about this now? Uh, because you have to approve this. I mean, so from, from you, I mean, from you, like, like to, to Susan's question, like why wasn't the planning commission informed of what was happening? We we thought it was said and done. We thought they had approved it and out of our hands. Yeah, well, because it was out of your hands. Yeah. Outside of this one thing that that has changed, that now comes back in front of the planning commission. But it's not out of our hands at all. I mean, I, I I'm really disturbed by this. We worked really hard to move this forward by a deadline, and I I feel like whether the folks in in Taftville were kind of present at every meeting or not. We made a decision that this was good policy. Who knows, the next owner for the general store may wanna go after a grant and we pushed so hard and I thought it was done. And you know, maybe that's bad on me, but um, to find, I mean, I think that one of the things that we've committed to from you know, from last year onward, is we can handle multiple things at one time if we have to. We've shown that we can schedule another meeting. I mean, this we made a commitment to get this through, and I feel like we're back in the same situation of hurry, 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 do something, and then let's wait and forget about it, and we have to start all over. Sorry, I'm really, I'm kind of really, I'm so surprised. But where is the change? And what are we voting on? And so the change is right here. I have it highlighted. That, that the adding future. that sentence, or what are we looking yeah. at? I can't see what this is. The, the the narrative that went with the changes. Yep. Yeah. So this is how it conforms with the goals set forth in forty three zero. So what what actually was the change made in the town plan? We haven't seen that. the revision to the future use land map to change. The so the commercial... map was changed. I mean, shouldn't we see the actual town plan? The change made on. Sure. Do we want to set another meeting? Yeah. This... If we're going to vote on something, we we need to see what it is that we're going to be voting on. Okay.
I, 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 I think that you should send this to us, Stephen, so that we have time to look at it because I assume that I, I well, let me ask it, ask this, let me ask this as a, let me ask this as a question. Um, are we going to be voting on the entire town plan or just this one piece? It's just it is just simply the it is just this report that you need to approve. Okay, can everyone see this? Yep. So these see four parcels one, two, three, four that are currently zoned commercial light investment. That is the um Wild Apple Graphics and yeah. the new storage place. Yeah, where the old Welch's was. So this was commercial light industrial when this was the old Welch's. It did not change with future res renditions of the town plan. Um, Two Rivers has caught it this time and said that that doesn't conform. We need you to change that from a CLI district to a BSLI which is pretty much the same thing minus a retail is prohibited. What is CSLI business? Uh, business service light industrial. Okay. That okay. is the change that we're talking about. So the, these four parcels, which is Schultz excavating and yep. uh, LDC. But this is going to require a hearing, right? We're making a zoning change. So this isn't as simple as one meeting, is it? Yes, it is, because you're not the final decision makers. That's between the trustees and the select board. When did they come back with this determination that we had to make this change? Um, I don't know. I want to say in January. So um, this would eliminate retail. That's why they want to do it. Yes. And why, why do they want to do it? Because they don't allow uh, retail that far away from the village city. The regional plan. Does. The regional plan. Does. And we had it as CLI because it had been. It had been retail. OK, but. As recent as the 2006 plan, which is where this now comes from. Oh. Okay. Hmm. Funny that they didn't. What happens if we don't change it? What? What happens if we don't change it? Then we don't get regional plan approval. They've made that fairly clear. Funny that they didn't catch it because they paid a lot of attention to our town plan last summer as we were working on the Castell Village designation. Mm -hmm. It is a simple change. I, 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 I'm happy to approve it. What do others feel? It's three, four lots. It's what? It's three to four lots that we're talking about in this area. Four, four lots. Four. None are currently retail. Only one of the four was retail original, the, the hardware store. The hardware store, right. Wild Apple Graphics wasn't, Schultz isn't, an LDT. I think that's the one across. I guess I just have a question. Can we do this since it wasn't on the agenda? It, it was on the agenda. Okay. So it was review, update, planning commission report to reflect <laughs> Two Rivers requirements on the town plan. It wasn't to change zoning. This is not. This is not. This is not a zoning file. This is part okay. of the town. Okay, but do we? Which is do, approved and adopted by the select board and trustees. Right. Afterwards. But 
but do we have to change the zone? Because our zoning the zoning district will change. Okay, it's the zoning district. Yeah, in the town plan. Okay, so we need to notify these folks. And is it so, storage sort of a retail operation? Not according to two rooms. Okay, we let them decide. Okay. Look, the select board pushed back on this quite a bit as well. They did? Um, yeah. Um, they didn't like the idea of having to change it at all. How and and it wasn't until the because they had they had a hearing after the planning committee. Because they have to have two hearings right. that were coming up on the second hearing. So two rivers went to them directly and told them the select board that that had to be changed. Yeah, well, they, they met with me and said, look, now that you've done this, we're coming with these changes. I said, okay. well, that's unfortunate because we're going to have to go back through and, and revise this plan, get our map changed. It took a while to get the map changed. And then all the while, there was a question of whether or not we were still going to do this because... But I, I, so I just have one question. If this happened in January, I don't understand why we weren't informed at the next meeting and we're only hearing about it in April. That's a three month gap. I feel like- Susan, because I didn't know whether or not the town leadership was going to want to go through with this. It doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. We had made a vote on something to be informed about the, the, the response of the town leadership back to us. I mean, what? so we would know where the status is. It seemed like the natural next step. Um, I, I may be off here. I don't know. I just- Well, the natural statutory next step is if a change was made that that change at the legislative level goes back to the planning commission. So that this, has- I'm not, I'm not talking about like law and what you have to do according. I'm just talking about general business practice. Like we made a decision at a meeting. It went to the select board just to get a report back on what happened. I, I'm, I'm just flummoxed that we're three months later and none of us, we're all kind of clueless about this. I'm sorry. I'm clueless about this. I'm not going to say anybody else is clueless. <laughs> I, I'm confused. I mean, is anyone okay. else well, the, any the sense about this? The is Two Rivers has said we need to revise our future land use map to change the CLI district in West, West Woodstock, or we're not going to get regional plan approval. Um, we now know that. We now have support from the leadership that they're going to go ahead and do that so we can adopt the plan so that simply, even though as bad as the plan is, we can get the village designation finished and moving forward. Sorry if the communication was not perfect for, for how it should have been. A lot of that was pointless things to reiterate. So. Well, I think we can, I, I don't know. I, I think we should move along, get it passed. And. But can I just add, um, just to Susan Silverberg's comments, I, I do agree with you wholeheartedly, Susan and Stephen. In the future, you know, we're as the planning commission, we deserve to know what's happening there. We have made a commitment to transparency, and I, for one, feel like you haven't been very transparent with us on this issue. So, um, you know, going forward. I want to hear if there is a problem, if there is an issue that relates to work that we have done. Um, I'm, I'll put that as a specific request from me. Um, whether the rest of the board wants to do that as well, it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate that. And I will relay to this board, like I did when we started this adoption process, as well as I've relayed um, to the select board and trustees leadership that we should not be taking on adoption processes to a comprehensive plan to benefit individual people. That's a separate issue. 
And that's yeah. an issue that has to be discussed as the commission. That's not what we're talking right now. We're talking about just communication. So that is that is a separate issue. I don't think we should muddy the waters here about that. Um, we had already done it. We had already agreed to do it. And um, got it all ready for it to go. So then it's in the select board and trustees hands until after their first hearing, we got this feedback. So. Any uh, thoughts on what, how to proceed? I don't think there's any more information that we can, that we need. We've seen what's going to be changed or has not on that map that we just saw. Uh, I do have a question. Um, so you're saying that Adequichi decided that we can't do X, Y, and Z in a certain area. So now we're left with an ugly storage unit along Route 4 in our community. Um, why does it have to be that way? And who decides that has to be that way? Uh, the legislature. I know that, that's a statutory requirement for how the town plan gets approved. Oh, you mean yeah, it has to be in the actual zoning that it has to be BSLI? Is that what you mean, Frank? Yeah. So who who deter who determined why this has to be this area and why? Well, I think what Stephen had said was that Two Rivers Regional Plan says that retail cannot be outside the downtown area. And that's out of town, as we know. So because there is no retail in that area now, it has to be changed to conform so that retail can't go back in. There. Am I correct? Correct. And that's why they made or require us to make that decision. Gotcha. A little late for them to be doing that with all the hands on that they had of our plans over the past year. But I think that's where my confusion is. Yeah. Um, so is, is, is the feeling that is there the feeling that we should approve this change to the town plan so that a joint select board and village trustees meeting uh, can review it at, at the end of May, I believe. April. Uh, we're in April. Thoughts? Sorry if this has been asked and answered, but the joint meeting will be like a public hearing. Like it will be warned the way that we would have warned the- It's been warned already. It was in last it's... week's paper. Okay, it's been warned already. All right, thank you, Susan. Well, should we just take a vote then? And uh, I, we need to approve it, right? Is that what the process is? We have to approve this. Thank you. Um, I mean, this could be presented on that meeting on April 27th. Um, so if we wanted to look at revisions to the 4302 report um we could set another meeting to do so um but yes april 27th would, would be kind of the deadline of when we present that okay but we need to approve the town plan change yeah that zoning change on that map yes which is what we do here in this report but we haven't approved it so we need to approve it, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to, can I make a motion? I never make motions because I'm chairman, but I guess I can. I move that we approve this revision to the land, uh, to the map in the town plan as requested by two 
now. Sorry, we need a second for the. Do we have a second? No. I can't hear anybody. I'll second. I'll second it. If if we need this approved in order to get regional plan approval, and maybe it'll help the task force sell that much more quickly. You know, I, I mean, I think that it wasn't a bad thing that we did, and um, it's very requiring. Okay. I mean, I any generally. Yeah. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor of making this change to the land use map. We say aye. 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 Three, four, three and a half. <laughs> three and a half. Okay. All right. So now we can, it can go to the joint meeting. It was a very minor change. So. But it would be, have been good. I would agree. I think we should have known as soon as they, well, our February 1st, that, that they did not want it to do. And the select board couldn't. Approve it, right? Um, and I, I think it's, yeah. Maybe okay. we should have put together a joint planning commission, select board, try and iron that out. Well, so, I don't think there was anything so, but, to iron out. I don't have a problem with the change they required. It was more that we could have addressed it, you know, at, at end, um, yeah. So, all right, we're moving on. And um, I think we're going to have to uh, put Eduardo on hold. Um, I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the um, sign, the zoning regulation for the sign, but his, his sandwich board and his banana flag, they, they, are not, they are not approved, as is his placement of the sandwich board. And so we really have to think of some kind of creative solution to help them out. Um, but I guess that'll have to wait till next month. If you all agree, we're ready to end this. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then other business, I just have to say, um, I am, I am um, going to finish my time on the planning commission. I'm, it's, it's kind of a, a bad time for me to do it, but I, I think it's best for me. Um, probably best for the commission. Um, so think about how you want to restructure and think about who would be uh, a good person to bring on to the commission. I, I, this is, uh, I want to follow that up. So first off, Susan, sorry to see you go. And I've been very appreciative for the way that you reluctantly <laughs> kind of took leadership and helped us move in a more efficient, transparent, proactive way. So, Thanks. so very much appreciated for all of Thanks. that. Um, I also want to follow up. I know Stephen, you had asked me, I guess, for a reappointment and I said yes with a caveat that I was going to be traveling quite a bit and unsure. I am actually, um, I am going to be kind of incommunicado for at least four months this fall doing a cross country road trip um, in celebration of my last child going off to college. Um, and I can't see a way to, for at least four months to be able to commit to seeing, to being at meetings. So I am also going to be rolling off the planning commission. Um, probably July is my last meeting, which will, I will try to do in person. Um, that'll be my three year anniversary. I looked back, I started on August, I think 5th of 2020. Um, so um, I just wanna give you enough heads up on that because I, I can in conscience kind of take a break for four or five months and then kind of sweep back in. I, I know we have some, requirement you can't miss more than two meetings in a year. Well so. Susan, your service has been superb. Thank you. Yeah. We got a few I'm more so, I'm, I'm so sorry to, that both of you both Susans are stepping off. You're you leaving <laughs> giant shoes um to fill your voices are have been so important to me um on this on this commission. Um 
Yeah. Thank you both. And I didn't know of Susan's decision. <laughs> I made mine, so it's not the best timing by far. <laughs> but I just can't see how I can fulfill my obligations on, while I'm traveling. Well, thank you um, both for your service. I really, I really appreciate having you both here, and I've learned a lot from both of you. Thanks, Laura. I would, I would love to work on a character survey as an adjunct member, not member, but um, to help out with the commission in Maine <laughs> and home Maine too. So. I will say I'm also willing to put in hours on things um, in a limited capacity, probably just, you know, till the end of July. And then I, I, I really will be kind of not available. So I'm taking a sabbatical from work, so. So it's, um, Really important that we, we think real hard about who um, who to bring on to this commission. Yeah, it's such important. Thank you all for your hard work. I'd also like to say what a bummer to lose both of the Susans. Um, we appreciate everything you guys have always have done for us. So thank you. I know it's only been a year that I've known everyone, but. I appreciate it. And I've learned a lot as well. And I appreciate you both. Thank you. All right. Well, this is a long one. So um, I'll uh, call to adjourn the meeting. I second. All right. All in favor. Aye. Bye.